We want to thank you for tuning in today to our newest program, Talking It Out. In this newest segment, Pastor David and Roby will be discussing such topics as Bible prophecy, current events, and the Word of God. We trust each of you will enjoy today's edition of Talking It Out. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Lankford, and with me today again is Roby Walker. We're excited about this new segment that we're producing for you entitled Talking It Out. And that's what we're doing here with this segment is talking about Bible prophecy, the Word of God, world, and current events. And I think that is so important in this hour because there's a lot of chatter, a lot of clamor, a lot of talk that's going on that's not scriptural, that's not spiritual to say the least. But in this segment, we're just trying to keep you concurrent with what is transpiring in the world. Rob, it's great to have you with us today on this Great to segment. be here. Thank Amen. you, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, every Thursday at 12 o'clock noon, this video will be up for all of you. So every Thursday at 12 noon, you'll be able to come to our website or to YouTube and pick up this video program. Uh, we want it to be a blessing to you. We want it to strengthen you and to encourage you. But before we get into uh, the subject today, uh, this is March the 12th. Is it March the 12th? March the 11th? It is. March, March the, the 12th. 12th uh, 2020. I do want to make mention one more time concerning the revival meeting that we had scheduled in Hickory, North Carolina for April the 16th through the 19th. We felt it was imperative that we make a decision and we live with our decision, and that was to cancel the revival meeting. It looks like we've made a very prudent and wise decision as things continue to accelerate. The industry of the cruise lines are plummeting. Airline stock, they're plummeting. Oil is plummeting. Everything is taking a negative turn. And we're not going to be talking about that today. We'll address that again next week. But I want to keep you abreast of what's going on. And now is the time for just plain common sense, just uh, some old horse sense, uh, stable thinking, as one man said. If we will do that, God will help us and protect us. We're told in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all of thy ways acknowledge the Lord, and he will direct your paths. The, the, the trouble and the danger we get into is when we completely and totally lean upon our own understanding because you're really trusting in yourself. In Psalm 118, verse 8, David said, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. And that also speaks of self-confidence. We don't need to be overly confident in our own thinking, but cast our cares cast our burdens upon the Lord, and he will see us through these perilous and tempestuous and troubled times. We hope in the near future to reestablish these revival meetings and bring you in so that the spirit and the grace of God can minister to your heart and to your life. But as I said the other week, I never want to do anything to harm you, endanger you in any way. And too many times people become self-centered and self-serving, and they say, we're going to do it anyway. And that's when people get harmed or get injured in some way. And we do not want to do that here at The Voice of Evangelism. We do covet your prayers, that you'll keep praying for us in the ministry, that God would order our steps. It's important that God orders each of us, that our steps will be ordered in his word. Because I come to understand the word of God is perfect, it lacks nothing, and if we can get our lives in alignment with God's word, his will will be totally and completely wrought within our hearts. Today we're going to be talking about socialism from the world perspective, and also what does the Bible have to say? What does the Bible declare relative to capitalism versus socialism? We're going to be talking about that today. Brother Roby, I'm going to give it to you right now, and just wherever you feel the Lord leads you, Let's go with it. Very good. Amen. We'll go. So, and reading and looking at a, a poll from the Pew Research Group, 
Uh, it said that 55% of Americans had a negative view of socialism, uh, and only 42% had a positive view of socialism. So it's like, okay, that that sounds okay, but if you go and look at another survey on YouGov, uh, the results were a little bit more troubling. They said most voters under 30, under the age of 30, they have a higher opinion of socialism at 43% wow. than they do of capitalism at 32%. So, and then I read another pro poll that found that 69% of voters under 30, they were willing to vote for a socialist candidate for president of the United States. Um, and that trend uh, is likely going to continue as we see the older generation move away and uh, get older and pass away. Uh, that trend is going to continue. That's so tragic because it's up to us older people. I'm 65 years of age to encourage the people to be willing to accept responsibility. Socialism is fundamentally about somebody else taking care of you and your needs. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's something edifying about self-preservation, working to make sure that I take care of my family, take care of my home, take care of my needs. Once my needs are met, that then allows me to go out and minister and to do other things for other people. But when you turn to socialism, you're expecting the leader of that government say, you'll take care of us. I don't have to care and worry about anything. Uh, you're going to babysit me through my entire life. And this is happening, folks, because people my age and older, we are passing away, and we're not instilling into the young people work responsibility, paying your bills, being at work all time, et cetera, et cetera. And socialization is great, but we have to be responsible. And God, we'll get into this in a moment. God is a God of capitalism. He created capitalism. He shows that in the word of God. So when people tell you God is opposed to capitalism or God is will bless socialism, that is contrary to the word. God truly is a capitalist. And we'll show that here in a few minutes from the Word of God. Go ahead, Brother Roby. Sure. So for older voters, socialism is associated with a lot of things from the past of communism, the Cold War, and the uh, Soviet Union. So in my office at home, I actually have a piece of the Berlin Wall. Um, so let me just ask you a quick question. What do you remember about the Berlin Wall? How it separated the people from a communistic nation and a free world. Absolutely. They're in Berlin, East, East Berliners and West Berliners. So millennials, that uh, they were either not born or they were, they were less than seven years old when the Berlin Wall was torn down, and that fell in 1989. They don't have a sense of even a world existing with the Soviet Union. It uh, doesn't exist in their vernacular. Um, they may have seen the movie, uh, it was 20, 2015, uh, Bridge of Spies, Steven Spielberg set in the 1960s. They may have seen that movie or whatever. And that's a good segue uh, into talking about uh, people moving and things that they had to do between East Berlin and West Berlin. But in 1948, Winston Churchill said this. He was paraphrasing a quote from an earlier time, but he said, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And we're certainly seeing that today. You know, it was Roosevelt Wilson um, that created Social Security. I remember correctly, or, 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 or was it Franklin? Yeah, FDR. FDR, Roosevelt, FDR. Uh, think about that phrase, social security. Too many times we don't evaluate the word or the phrase. So what were they doing back then? I think it was created in 1935, if I remember, somewhere in that era, uh, social security was uh, created. Social security. So socialization and the fomenting of it is going to secure your life. Now, social security is nothing but a Ponzi scheme. Uh, my, my personal greatest debt and payment each month is into my social security. And um, it, it, I don't enjoy paying that. And I was living a very quiet and peaceable life now because I'm not able to draw Social Security. I have to pay a percentage of my income back into Social Security. I also had to go now and get a, a supplemental policy, which they indebted me another $300 a month, and I still get no Social Security income. So they increased my indebtedness. Why? To pay for other people. Now, 
that was supposed to have been just some way to help people. But it turned into a program where it is trying to pay the bills for older people in its entirety. And it was just supposed to have been, in this beginning, a security net, a safety net. And now it's turned, it's the, it's the greatest encumbrance, it's the greatest debt on the United States government, Social Security. Yeah, I know that my grandfather, I never had the privilege of meeting him, but he worked in textile mills uh, in eastern North Carolina all of his life and retired at 65 and passed away the next month. So he collected one month of Social Security. Um, so that you know, and so when social social security was created, um, it, the span of life was much shorter than it is today, and that's part of the dilemma. Now you think about that. Your family, your your your, your grandmother, if she was to live, she didn't get that money. She may have got what he was making, but she didn't get anything for herself. So, if you let's say you are sixty five years of age and you have no family. You paid into the system for 45 plus years and you pass away. Where does that money go? The government keeps it. Now, my grandfather, on both of my parents' side, made out like bandits. Mm-hmm. My grandpa, Chris and Barry, on my mother's side, may have paid in $1.50 a week when he was working. He retired in 1965. He was born in 1900. What I find ironic about that, he lived 29 more years and when he first went into Social Security after he retired, I know because I moved in with him, his Social Security check was $123 a month. Well, when he died, it was almost $1,200 a month. It had a 10-time increase. He paid so little into that system and got so much out. That doesn't count the medical care. And he had some, he had a gallbladder surgery and one or two other very simple things, but a man like him, and this is not to condemn or castigate, he put a profuse burden on the system. Well, you think, of, just multiply that 10,000 people a day in America are retiring and going on the Social Security program. That's overwhelming. 10,000 a day, 70,000 people a week, 280,000 a month are going on to this system. And of course, when you keep advocating and appropriating socialism, who's going to pay for all this? Because they never thought this Ponzi scheme, as you well said, would grow to this extent and people would draw on it for 20, 25, and even 30 years. True. Socialism, though, that that's a good side. It's helping people out. But socialism also uh, is uh, known for being having some of the worst violators of human rights history in the world. I mean, how do you know? Because it's happened time and time again. So most people, Pastor, are familiar with the atrocities of World War II and Adolf Hitler. Uh, And I apologize in advance for being morbid, but uh, General Secretary of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, he was responsible for the deaths of over 9 million of his people. Wow. And then further than that in China, uh, Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong, uh, his great leap forward, he was responsible for his program for killing 35 to 45 million Chinese. Wow. It doesn't work. It simply does not work. And I want to look today for a few minutes in Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to show you how that God is a capitalist and how he dispersed funds. Matthew 25, beginning at verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. To every man according to his own several ability and straightway took his journey. <clears throat> then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of that servant cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, 
Thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strewed or scattered. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. In other words, he just brought the one talent back. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strewed. Thou oughtest to therefore have put my money to the exchangers or bankers, and then at my coming I should have received mine on with usury or with interest. Take therefore the talent from him, give it unto him which hath ten talents, for unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now to validate, to authenticate that God is a capitalist, he gave one man five talents, he gave another man two talents, and the other man he gave one talent. Why did God not give them all the same amount of talents? Now let me say something here. We're both old school Pentecostal. I've heard it preached all my life, talents were singing, craftsmanship, art, preaching, uh, my ability to memorize Bible verses. They would deem those were talents. That's not what the Bible is talking about here. It's talking about literal talents of gold money. You can't put your talent of singing, your talent of preaching, your talent of ministry in the bank and draw interest. You have to have some kind of money monetary means, uh, uh, something that is, uh, can be exchanged uh, or hypothecated in some capacity. That is real hard money. But just a, a gift relative to having a talent of being able to sing beautifully, you can't draw interest on that by putting it in the bank. So when we were taught, when we were younger, these men were preaching, you know, don't bury your talents, singing, teaching, preaching, playing an instrument or whatever. That's not what the Bible's talking about here. He's talking about money. And to, 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 to prove that God is not into socialism, he did not give everybody the same thing. That's what socialism is about. Everybody's on a level playing ground, uh, government-funded health care, one payer. In other words, no matter who you are, where you are, what your stature is in life, if you're a billionaire like Mike Bloomberg, you're going to get the same care is if you were in poverty. It's sad to see what's happening. But don't ever think God is into socialism because he did not give these men the same amount of talent. That's important to remember. Absolutely. It's, it's sad that people think somehow life is a, 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 is a free ride. It's, it's a gravy train. And so Jesus got upset with this one man because he only gave, he, he gave him one talent. He wanted and he buried that. And whether we realize it or not, this wicked, slothful servant, he lied on Christ. He lied on his Lord. How do we know? Verse 24, chapter 25, verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strewed or scattered. That was a lie. Nobody reaps without sowing. Jesus, the Lord, the representative here, he 
did so into that man's life. It's just the man took the talent and he buried it. And so when Jesus said you could have given it to the money exchangers, that word exchangers there in the Greek means bankers. You could have at least put my money in the bank and have gotten usury. The word usury there is interest. But you didn't bother to do that. So if God was into socialism, the playing ground would be level. Everyone would have gotten at least five talents across the board. But in my mind, and which is very minuscule, he knew already this servant was slothful. So he didn't trust him with much. To whom much is given, much is required. And because he didn't trust him with much, he didn't give him much because he knew what he would do with it. And so if you get into socialism, you're not going to do anything but trust the government to meet your needs. Go ahead. That is very true. I know that uh, a lot of 20% of the world leave, live today in repressive regimes, uh, China and Vietnam and North Korea and Cuba, uh, even Venezuela. Yes. Uh, but I visited, Pastor, the People's Republic of China in 1981. And I know from taking the train to Lo Wu, which was from Hong Kong, uh, and then the train station was there. You got off the train, you had to walk across the bridge, and uh, you went through their checkpoint there. And I just remember how oppressive and repressive the feeling was uh, getting that uh, red star in my U.S. passport. Uh, and I actually was with a college group that we were actually smuggling in Bibles uh, in Chinese Mandarin language there. Wow. Uh, very, very dangerous work, especially for those that were receiving Absolutely. Them. Uh, but I know that uh, there in China, it was incredible. So going back and looking at History Pastor with Mao Zedong, his great experiment, uh, that experiment has failed. And China has now moved away from communism to capitalism with an author authoritarian government. Right. Uh, so what that means is like uh, in Hong Kong, when I was there, it was a totally separate uh, part of the Commonwealth. I was not part of China at the time. And then after 156 years, um, Hong Kong reverted back to China in 1997. Uh, so Beijing now uses the phrase, one country, two systems. Uh, but they see that communism itself failed. Right. Um, Karl Marx is the one that made the profound statement, socialism is the transitioning point between capitalism and communism. You first are a capitalist, you gradually drift and waft into socialism, and then from there it becomes total, utter despotic into communism. And the naivety of young people in America, you know, one of the great commandments of God to Israel was keep perpetuating Keep in perpetuity the things I did for you in the wilderness. You need to tell your children how I rained manna down from heaven, how I sent the quail, how the water came out of the rock, how that you walked in the same shoes, you wore the same clothes for 40 years. They never wore out. These are testimonies. And God said, I want you to keep telling these testimonies, these things I did for Israel. Keep telling them. So the children, the young people will know what I have done. And in America, we've quit preaching the Bible. We, we don't have any more Pentecostal great stories to share anymore of, of great dynamic moves of God. And then you have, you know, the Exodus. And, and then we have the Pentateuch, the, the, the five books of the Pentateuch. And then we go into Joshua. Then we go into Judges. Joshua kept perpetuating the greatness of God. But then when you come to the book of Judges, there's a verse in there, Judges 2.10, and there arose another generation that knew not God. Why did they not know about Jehovah Elohim? Because the previous generation quit teaching, quit preaching the great things of God. So what did it say? There arose a, another generation. There grew another generation that did not know who God was. And that brings me to Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9, where Solomon said, Lord, feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Who is this God 
Who is this so-called savior? Regretfully, that's what we're doing in America. We are raising a generation that knows nothing about the purity of God's holy word. Amen. Right. You mentioned, Pastor, also the transition from capitalism to socialism to communism. And I've heard the phrase that communism, people have no personal property. You, have, you don't have property itself. And in socialism, you just think you have property. That's, that is profound, what you just said. And that piqued my mind. Um, I, I, I can't remember his name. He's a minister from Cuba. And he told me, bro, this is in the 50s. Uh, to show you that despotic rule, they would come into their house, the Cuban soldiers, with a, a legal pad or shorts, with a clipboard, and they would go through their homes and write down even the pictures on the wall so that they would inventory everything in every home. And if they came back in that home, that picture was missing or that item was not there, they wanted accountability of it. In other words, we own it all. And I'm thinking, can you imagine a government that intrusive to come into your home, my home, with a scanner nowadays, scan everything in your house, and that would let them know as a government how much their wealth is. That's why God told David, don't you number Israel. I don't want you to know. I don't want you to trust in your own numbers. And of course, what did he do? Uh, First Chronicles 21, 1, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. The very thing that God said do not do, Satan provoked David to do it. 70,000 souls were lost because David disobeyed God. And even when Josiah went out to count, he told him, David, this is, we shouldn't do this. I'm the king. Go and do it. Again, self-serving, self-centered. And, and so many people lost their lives. And David knew that. And uh, he said, let me just fall into the hands of the judgment of God. He said, if I fall into the hands of the judgment of men, men are never just. He said, but if I can fall into God's hands, I'll get justice and not retribution like a man would give me if he judged me. Go ahead there. Well, so we've talked about China. We've talked a little bit about Cuba. So if you're, you're wanting another example in the Western Hemisphere, you don't have to go any further than the country of Venezuela. So Venezuela, and you may remember this, uh, had the highest standard of living in Latin America. Um, some said socialism could never happen there, uh, but it did. They were, as a country, Venezuela, they were uh, rich in oil and diamonds and other min minerals there. Uh, so when Hugo Chavez, when he was elected as their president in 1998, they started their road to socialism. And what happened is Chavez lied about who he was. He was socialist, but he lied about that. And he said he was going to fix Venezuela and that if he were not a good president, he was going to step down after five years. Right. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, now, even in the country of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, he continues those same failed policies. So the result today is Venezuela is where 90% of Venezuelans actually live in poverty. Inflation is forecast at 10 million percent this year. There are shortages of food, medicine, electricity, and other basics. Uh, they have horrific levels of crime. And the United Nations, they report that between four and five million Venezuelans have already fled their country. So tragic. And, and when he's talking about Venezuela there, they are one of the most, uh, what's the word am I looking for, uh, elevated societies. Uh, these people, you know, I, I've been to some other third world countries. They are just as modernistic as America. Wi-Fi, cable, internet, opulent motels, restaurants, boats, you know, personal prosperity items, Mercedes Benz, all these great things. It's all gone. Hmm. It's all gone. As you well said, starving to death, eating dogs, eating cats. You say, how can that be? If America keeps renouncing God... That'll happen in America because you reap what you sow. That's, that law is applicable to Christians or sinners. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Paul said, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So socialism is sowing into the flesh. And what do you reap? Corruption. 
in, in every sense of the word, politically, economically, governmentally, even physically in the body, you sow this refuse, this garbage, that's what you're going to reap. People say, well, I don't believe that. That's why he, Paul prefaces that statement, be not deceived. Don't fool yourselves. Don't trick yourselves into believing, oh, we can do this and there's no consequences. That's not true, folks. There is consequence for every action that every one of us takes every day of our lives. You know, if I don't, when I get to the intersection, if I don't judge the speed of the cars, and I say, it doesn't matter, I'll pull out anyway. If I have a, if I got T-boned or cause a wreck, that's the consequence because I didn't judge something. I, I didn't adjudicate it in my mind, the speed, the movement of the cars, time it takes me to get out. I'm going to suffer. And, and that, what do I suffer? Corruption. It's, it's a type of destruction because I did not do the right thing. Go ahead and share some more with us there. Let me share with you a quote. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, she was yes. the former prime minister in the UK. She said, the trouble with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. <laughs> How true. Because socialism is it, kind of the, the Robin Hood scenario. You take from the rich and you give to the poor. We hear that from a Cortez, Bernie Sanders, but Capitalism has allowed Bernie Sanders to have three homes in America. Well, he's very quick to say it's two homes and a, and a summer cottage. Yeah. So. Well, <laughs> if you're paying property taxes on it, Bernie, it's a home. The county sees it as a home. Um, capitalism is, is fundamentally based on how hard are you willing to work. You know, people castigate Mike Bloomberg because he has $60 billion. So what? He got into the right system, computer, internet, and he was able to make a lot of money. I've said this for years. You know, I'm not smart enough because I don't know anything about computers, but that's where the growth is right now. All, all these uh, stock traders just go there, open up an account on the internet, and, and, and trade stock. You know, this is, this is how this works. You know, if you make good decisions, you're going to make a lot of money. Uh, I'm old school. I, I, I do it the old-fashioned way, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. But nevertheless, that's capitalism because God did not give every man the same thing. I want to share a passage from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7. For yourselves know how we ought to follow us, how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, Neither did we eat any man's bread for nothing or naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. So Paul confronts the issue of idle hands. People not working, people are being literal busy bodies. Clamor, Gossip, sowing discord. Uh, you know, we say it all the time on the internet. One of the one of the great travesties in Christendom is the internet, and that people get on there, make slanderous, gossiping statements. They repeat things that are not true. They tell them as though they were truth, and it's destroying the fiber, the fabric of this country. You know, one of Trump's greatest criticisms is the Twitter. Twitter. I don't even know how to say it. Uh, Twitter. Because he says things, you know, he pontificates. I'm not saying he's lying, but it's it's a stoke to stir people, to provoke people. And so if you're busy working, like Paul said, with your own hands, you're earning your own income, you're buying your own bread and not eating another man's bread. Absolutely. He's, he's a master at... Uh, um, using the limitation of 140 characters or less. Uh, yes. He certainly does, as you say, learn to stoke the fire. Um, so 
some people have asked, what is, what's even appealing about socialism? So socialism to uh, the younger generation, it seems fine when you're talking about free education, free health care. Okay, that's, uh, that's an interesting thing. But you're talking about free education, Pastor. So uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, they give a quarterly report on household debt. Uh, and the most recent report is available last month for the fourth quarter of 2019. Um, that's where they combine mortgages, student loans, auto loans, credit cards, and home equity lines. All those combined together, it equates to $14.1 trillion. Wow. Um, student loan, that student loan debt, it's the fastest growing segment of household debt in America. Um, student loans right now stand at $1.51 trillion. That's trillion with a T. That's a lot of money. Student loans are a liability of household debt. But here's the interesting thing. It is also the largest line item asset in Uncle Sam's financial accounts. Wow. You know, and, and when you're a realist, and I try to be a realist, I try to look at things for what they are. You know, and they created these Pell Grants, you know, different things to help young people get an education. But how many people do they get an education in a particular uh, segment or degree in a particular profession, but then they never use it? You know, they end up doing something else, but yet they accrued all this debt, encumbered their life with this debt, and they're doing something else. Let me say this. College is not for everyone. I mean, I didn't go to college. Brother Robe here went to college, has numerous degrees. To me, that's what helps me when somebody like you has that education to refine things. But my two sons, I offered them the chance to go to college. They wanted the vocation where they earn a, and, and work as a trade, of doing something, of mechanically welding. Uh, my youngest son is a lineman uh, in the utility. A mother's son works in a, a system where they uh, remanufacture, rebuild cranes inside of manufacturing plants where they pick up the heavy equipment, move it from one side of the plant to the other with these cranes in the ceiling. They know how to do stuff. They, they know how to work on a car. They know how to do all sorts of stuff. But they, like me, didn't have that desire uh, to go to college, you know. And uh, regretfully, I wasted my college years uh, in sin. And God redeemed all of that. He did. Back in my life and blessed me with a, uh, an appetite. I mean, I love God's Word so much, Brother Robe. I just, every day I'm in the Bible. It's my life. If, if I don't have any Bible, I really have nothing to say to the people, mm. from, you know, from my heart. Because... That's where the message is, is what thus saith the Lord. And of course, you know, prayer's no longer in school. You know, we had devotions with our children every night where we read the Bible, we prayed. I tried to teach my children the godly principles. I know you were taught the same way. But regretfully, we're, we're in another generation, another place, another state, in the sense that families aren't praying together. They're not reading the Bible together. You'd be surprised. How many people sit down at the dinner table and never thank God for the food that's there? They just start eating. I, you've heard me say this. I won't eat a peanut butter cracker without thanking God for it. Uh, that's just how I feel about it. That's my conviction. So share some more with us here today about the class warfare. Sure. Things. So certainly class four warfare is a long-running theme of socialism. So I just wanted to share a quote from Dinesh D'Souza. He was speaking at, to students at uh, New York University at mm -hmm. Buffalo. Uh, this was last fall, last November. So let me uh, share an interesting quote that he said. He said, classic socialism is rich against the poor. In America, we have what I call identity socialism, where socialism is married to identity politics. Yes, it's the rich against the poor, but it's also the black against the white, the illegal against the legal, the man against the woman, and the gay against the straight. So this whole idea of democratic socialism is to create enough oppression to build a coalition of victims in this country who can then create a political majority who can then loot all the other guys against their will to give us all of this free stuff. Now that, that, is, so, that is so tragic. And the, all this is by design. It is satanic design. It's not a godly design, but it's to bring about greater elements of bondage. You know, I don't want somebody telling me, this is what you get to eat this week. Beans, rice, et cetera, et cetera. 
But this is what's taking place under socialism. People don't realize this. Uh, Mike Bloomberg has already said it. He's on tape. Let him die. He's mm -hmm. lived a good life, etc. That is, life is precious. I don't care if you are 90 years of age. Your life is still precious. Your life is still valuable. But, but these people that are sinister, they're evil, they disregard life. And, you know, being a minister, and then secondly, uh, when I think about this, these people, because they have no God awareness, they're not conscious of God. Uh, when I get ready to do something, you get ready to do something. Is this right? Is this wrong? What, what makes us think like that? God is in our thinking. Uh, Psalms 10.4. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all of his thoughts. In other words, in the process, don't think Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. and Alexander Cortez sat down and say, God, is this right? God, do I do this? God, do we murder these children? Do we abort these children? Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, all these people. Do we murder them? They don't, they don't ask that question to God because you know what the Holy Spirit would say? No. No. So they don't acknowledge God in any of their ways, and they're leading us down a path of utter chaos and destruction. And it's sad. But this will only get worse until the church turns back to Jehovah and we repent of our sins. Amen. Go ahead and share with us some other things. I, I know that we're running short sure. on time, but let me just share a couple of other quotes here. And. Uh, um, I was born in 1960, but Eisenhower was president of the United States when I was born. So I uh, was going back, going back and looking at some quotes, and let me share this with you. President John F. Kennedy in 1961, uh, during his inaugural speech, he said, and you remember this, yes, as I you do. well do, and so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, but rather ask what you can do for your country. But earlier in that exactly same speech in 1961, he also said this. He said, the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of Almighty God. And then wow. just a few days before that, Pastor, President Eisenhower said this in what is referred to as his farewell speech to the American people. Now, this is... General Ike, you know, Eisenhower, he served two terms as President of the United States. He also was the uh, Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force with D-Day, World War II, and all that. So, But anyway, his farewell speech to the American people is something that is often quoted today, and I wanted to read that to you. He said, as we peer into society's future, we, you and I, and our government, must avoid the impulse to live only for today plundering for our own ease and convenience the precious resources of tomorrow. We cannot mortgage the material assets of our grandchildren without risking the loss also of their political and their spiritual heritage. We want democracy to survive for all generations to come, not to become the insolvent phantom of tomorrow. Wow. Think about that. I remember that you know, profound, renowned statement of Kennedy. Ask not what your country can do for you. What can you do for your country? Folks, that's been uh, basically nearly 60 years ago. Look how much it has turned. It's now, what can you do for me? Entitlement. That, that's what he was, that word probably wasn't even thought about or used back then, but he was already addressing entitlement. You owe this to me. Health care, education, all of this stuff. That's just not true. He recognized that. Why? Because he was in that World War II generation. They understood the sacrifice. They understood how if you work hard, you'll have great success. But now listen to your new leaders. Why? It's a bygone generation. And regretfully, we are not instilling the proper attributes into our young people, into this generation. I hope you've enjoyed this segment today of Talking It Out. I want to pray before we leave today. Next week, we're going to be addressing uh, probably current events with the coronavirus and just how damaging this might end up being to the entirety of the world and how that we need God's grace. And, and I can't emphasize this enough. No one with a mega platform is yet to preach repentance. 
They're not saying anything about it. Or let's pray that God would put his hand on the world and stop this devastating uh, virus that's going around and what it's doing. It's just go along to get along. But I want to take a moment to pray today and ask God to touch you, your home, your family, your marriage, maybe your business, whatever that it might be, that God's grace would abound in your heart. Father, as we humble ourselves today, and we come before your mighty and majestic throne. We come to you knowing that you have the answer for every need, for every measure of opposition that we may be facing today. Father, I pray for every home, every family, every marriage, every business person. I pray your blessings upon them. I pray for the president of these United States. Father, I know a peril of darkness will soon sweep over this nation. Thus, I want to repent of my sins. And I ask you to forgive us of the things we may have said or done that has been grievous to the Holy Spirit of God. God, I ask you to bring revival in America. And I ask you somehow to use the voice of evangelism to touch tens of thousands of lost souls. I don't know how you can do that, but I know that you're bigger than any problem. You have the ability to do anything because you are the God of all flesh. Help us to reach the lost. Help us to reach the backslider. Those who've become tepid and different, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would bring them back to a place, a posture, a position of repentance, Lord God. God, I thank you today for those who love us and support this ministry. I thank you for every gift. I thank you for every sacrifice they have made that we might continue to bring an uncompromising message from the word of God each and every week. Now, God, give us the divine leadership that we so immensely need. We are limited, God, but there are no limitations in your kingdom. Now, bless us and keep us, and I pray that you will forever order our steps in your most holy word, wherein no sin or no iniquity could ever have dominion authority, neither lordship over our lives. We want you to be the Lord and Savior of our lives. Now, Father, continue to bless us and watch over us, and we'll give you praise and thanksgiving for all that you do. And Father, we humbly ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Rob, you have any parting words you want to share with the people today? I do not. I've shared enough quotes and that's probably uh, going to hold it for now. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll pick it up again next week. Okay. Thank you for tuning in. Again, each Thursday at noon, we'll have the next segment of Talking It Out on the video or YouTube internet. God bless you. We'll see you next week in the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. We want to thank you for tuning in today as we discuss current events from a biblical perspective. Please feel free to send us your questions. Who knows, your question may be the one they discuss on the next edition of Talking It Out. Please send your emails to talkingitout at thevoiceofevangelism.com. Again, talkingitout at thevoiceofevangelism.com. Or write us at Talking It Out, P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. Again, that's P.O. Box 502, Kaiser, North Carolina, 28020.